Um, okay, well, I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker. It's uh, John Kloppenborg, who is Professor and Chair of the Religion Department in the University of Toronto, of course. Uh, John is very well known f uh, particularly for his uh, he's probably the most prominent Q scholar alive today, but also for other work on Christian origins such as Networks and Associations, the Epistle of James. But of particular relevance for today, he's also, I think, Chair of the Context Group. Um, so um, could we please welcome John to give the first paper on social scientific approaches. Thanks, uh, James. Um, you've got a copy of the paper, which is way, way too long, so I'm going to be jumping around a lot. And I, I found this a kind of hard assignment when Chris asked me to talk about uh, from honor and shame to the modern study of social science approaches to um, early Christianity. It's an enormous area, and I actually don't know it. Uh, David, I've, I've used, I've plagiarized David Horrell's uh, 2002 paper. Um, for some kind of orientation, which is a, which, since he ought to be giving this paper. But, so here are some musings. I'm going to be jumping around uh, uh, quite a bit in this paper. Um, so, uh, intensive social science theorizing of Christian origins is now, I think, 50 years old. Uh, there were a few earlier intimations, but uh, for this retrospective, uh, and prospective, I select uh, 50 years in 1968 uh, for a particular reason, and it has to do with changes in the larger political and cultural context of scholarship, uh, which had the effect of redirecting interests of New Testament scholars, now called scholars of Christian origins, uh, away from forms of inquiry that privileged um, systems of thought uh, called theology uh, and came to inquire into the social, economic, political, and material contexts of early Christ followers and their forms of cultural production. By the beginnings of the 1970s, a new direction in scholarship had developed that raised questions of the social location of the Jesus movement, and more generally, the relationship between social location, ideology, and theology. No longer were contextless ideas and texts enough. Uh, texts were now treated, tri uh, tr treated as productions of particular groups with specific social locations and therefore with particular ways of viewing themselves in relationship to the world. These socially located persons had interests that needed support and defense and they had aspirations and behavioral patterns uh, that required some justification. Ideas were still important but the f focus had shifted f uh, to ideas as they are expressive of and embedded in the social world of the persons who held them. Now, there were some er earlier gestures in the direction of sort of social, um, s socially responsible um, approaches to the study of early Christianity. And one thinks of form criticism's quest for Zitz im Leben uh, of the units that made up the synoptic tradition. But form, criticism, form criticism's analytic categories were still wedded to ecclesial language, and so one talked about kerygma, exhortation, apologetics, uh, catechesis, liturgy, and so forth. Uh, and probably more problematically, Boltzmann's version of form criticism existed alongside neo-orthodox theological views that treated the kerygma as essentially unconnected to social and historical contexts. The kerygma was the deity's communication to humankind, and as such, uh, not comparable to any other kind of human striving uh, for redemption, uh, that is uh, what neo-Orthodox theologians called religion. There's religion on one side, which is human aspirations to redemption, and then there's, on the other side, there's God's actual real communication, and the two are entirely different. Uh, qualitatively. Such a position ultimately disinclined partisans of neo-orthodox uh, approaches from any kind of comparativism since ex hypothesis, the nature of the Christian kerygma was, was radically other. Debelius, uh, also uh, uh, influenced by neo-orthodoxy, um, used literary comparative literary categories of krea and paranesis that he borrowed from Greek literature and that seemed to 
uh, to be setting early Christian discourse in a much broader comparative context. And this could have produced an analysis of the synoptic tradition, for example, uh, as a particular form of persuasive speech that uh, led to a, kind of, a certain kind of social imaginary. But his ends were also directed to uh, strongly theological um, ends. Uh, and the results were that form criticism didn't investigate social location as much as it reinscribed ecclesial locations and ecclesial interests. There was almost no effort to address the broader questions of the social status or the economic level of, early, of the early uh, partisans of the Jesus movement, or to adopt theoretical models that would help to clarify the relationship between the social location of early Christians and the particular characteristics of their discourse. The dominant theological and idealist predilections of scholarship prior to the 1970s proved stubborn obstacles to genuine social analysis. To be sure, a few scholars prior to the 1970s offered social descriptions and explanations, but their insights interestingly gained almost no footing. Uh, and here I think especially of Edwin Judge's The Social Patterns of uh, Christian Groups in the First Century, which was published in 1960, but it was barely cited or even noticed for another 10 or 12 years um, before Robert Wilkin published his essay, Collegia, Philosophical Schools and Theology in 1971, where he uh, paid attention to, uh, to judge. And as far as I know, that's the first time that anyone noticed this book that was already 11 years old. Uh, and I'm always interested in these um, publications that are kind of uh, born out of time. Walter Bauer's Orthodoxy and Heresy in 1934 is another example of a book that was really innovative got badly reviewed in 1935, and no one notices it until 1972 when uh, Robert Kraft has it translated into English and Moore Zeebeck issues a second edition of it. So, I mean, it's really interesting to look at these things that, you know, you know it gives everyone sort of a kind of consolation that my book, no one has no one's paid attention to it, you know, but maybe 30 years from now somebody will. <laughs> uh, let's hope. Um, uh, it was uh, in the uh, late 1960s that seminal articles and monographs started to appear that began to take social location seriously and which argued that early Christians adopted noticeably countercultural social and political uh, profiles. These were, the for the most part, written in the wake of the 1968 student riots uh, in, Germ in Germany and France, uh, the height of the American involvement in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and the protests that this, that this involvement elicited, the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, and the killing of students uh, in, at Kent State University by the National Guard. These events, I suggest, problematized the perceived relationship between intellectuals and their universities on, one, on the one side, and the political and cultural institutions that universities had once been seen to support on the other. It also split mainline churches down the, down the middle along political lines and precipitated a recognition uh, that mainline Protestant churches especially had come to support dominant political structures uh, in part by treating religion as a purely private pietistic practice that had no political or social interest or impact. Their only task was to produce good and compliant citizens. The widening gap that opened between uh, political and military cultures and those of the universities, however, also created a space in which it was possible now to ask about the social location of the early Jesus movement, their economic interests, and to reassess the significance of group formation. In fact, we might see the events of 1968 as affecting a disassembling of the academic, or a disembedding of the academic uh, study of Christian origins from its ecclesial, social, and political context uh, that Christian origins had once seemed to serve. Uh, if you're looking at the text, I'm passing over the next paragraph. It's Robin Scroggs' article in 1975 entitled, The Earliest Christian Communities as a Sectarian Movement, that also typifies one of the shifts that I want to uh, talk about from an approach that was interested mainly in ideas, 
uh, and seen to be contiguous with ecclesial cultures, to one that connected Christian origins to broader explanatory models and not ecclesial interests. In Scroggs' case, the explanatory model was uh, the sociology of sectarianism, borrowed from Werner Stark, uh, Brian Wilson, and others. To have called early Christianity a sectarian movement a decade or two earlier would have been completely unthinkable. And in fact, you can check this out. I mean, Google sectarian and Christianity, and you're gonna, not going to find anything prior to 1975. Uh, I mean, I also find it really interesting when these analytic categories appear, uh, and that's, this is one of the analytic categories, and then ask why, uh, why it appears now and not some other time. And I think uh, David has talked a little bit about this as well. Uh, Scroggs's hypothesis, uh, which had been fed by his reading of Herbert Marcuse and Norman O. Brown, uh, was that early Christian groups can be described meaningfully as sectarian, they were characterized by protest. They rejected dominant um, constructions of society. They had an egalitarian ethos. They cultivated high emotional intensity within the group, and they demanded total commitment of their members. Scroggs paid express attention to social location using models borrowed from the social science and sciences, and he characterized early Christian groups as countercultural uh, in their social practices. Uh, in the context of the 1970s, Scroggs' essay exemplified the growing conviction that the early Jesus movement was not just about ideas, even radical ideas, but expressed in its practices a criticism of and resistance to dominant cultural discourses. The tools of the exegete now had to include methods by which uh, uh, those uh, social practices could be described and evaluated. Um, in the decades that uh, follow, um, many studies uh, appeared that started to ask broadly sociological questions. Some focused on social description, uh, inquiring into such social realia as occupations, food, housing, clothing, family structures, and travel, and so forth. These excursions into social description, as it was practiced by New Testament scholars in its earliest phases, were in some ways simply an extension of historical criticism. That is, the, the uh, exegete was now adding to his or her toolbox uh, a bunch of other stuff that now supplemented philological uh, data. Um, uh, and it was now recognized that in order to avoid anachronism, one had to pay attention to that other package of sort of uh, social historical uh, material. Um, and yet, uh, I think uh, another important essay that occurs about this time is in 1975 when Jonathan Z. Smith publishes an article on the social description of early Christianity where he made the important point that social description without social theorization is mute. That is, the social data don't tell us anything until you've actually got a, a, a proper analytic framework uh, that helps you uh, make sense of it. Or Richard Rohrbach puts the matter more pointedly. Uh, theoretical frameworks, or what he calls cognitive maps, uh, are ways to organize complex data to make sense of them. They are not optional. One either embraces such maps intentionally, or one continues to operate with default maps that come from one's own implicit biases and assumptions about the world. Uh, social analysis then requires a meta-reflection on how social data uh, can be used to produce uh, knowledge. Um, and I think we're probably all, already, all familiar with, with that kind of shift that has happened, and I won't, uh, I won't belabor that point uh, at all. A second, and I think um, uh, current change that's happening, um, that, that is in addition to explicitly adopting um, social models for thinking about the social data that we now have, has to do with the analytic vocabulary that we use. Uh, much of our earlier categories still rely on emic terms that are simply transliterated in, into English, like baptism, Eucharist, demon, apostle, uh, and so forth, or terms that can be traced back to the Greek vocabulary of our sources, mission, grace, church, faith, conversion, and so forth. There's two unhappy consequences of using uh, those terms as the major analytic terms that we're using, uh, that, we, that we employ. 
First, it implicitly anchors this study of Christian origins in ecclesial language and interests. Most of these terms in English, and I take it in Italian and German as well, no longer have the wide lexical range that charis or ecclesia or pistis have in Greek. Uh, grace and faith have a much more restricted semantic range in English than their Greek counterparts. Uh, thus, the use of a term like grace hides its relationship to other redistributive and gift exchange practices in the ancient world. Uh, pistis and fide, or fides, as Teresa Morgan has shown recently, has a mu has, have much broader ranges of connotation than faith does uh, in English or glaba does in, has in German. Uh, and so, by continuing to use those ecclesially connected words, we actually implicitly restrict the comparative, uh, our, our ability to do proper comparison. Um, uh, and it's for that reason that uh, in a book that I'm almost done with, uh, uh, for Yale, uh, I don't use the term church or community. I use Christ assemblies uh, to describe, and it's a very lumpy and unfortunate term to use, but the problem is if I use church, it immediately, it immediately contracts what, uh, what I'm doing. And so I think um, part of the point here is for us to look for a vocabulary that allows for genuine comparison with other kinds of ancient phenomena. Um, uh, the second problem is these terms like faith and uh, church and so forth in English, instead of connecting the discourse of early Christianity with other realms of contemporary culture, they actually serve to isolate it. We don't speak of men's service clubs in our cities as having Eucharists. Uh, they have meals, right, or they have communal meals. Um, we don't call the meeting of the city council uh, a church. We call it a meeting of the city council or an assembly or something like that. Um, so basic to the redescription of early uh, Christ assembly should, I think, involve the use of much less theologized categories uh, and to turn to terms like recruitment instead of mission, assembly instead of church, communal meal instead of Eucharist, gift or thanks in place of grace, loyalty in place of uh, faith. Uh, uh, and I'm not set on these, these terms, but I think we need to be really careful about the way in which we use those terms so that we're actually not implicitly constricting what it is that we uh, think we're doing. I'm going to pass over about 10 pages of the paper now. Um, uh, and I, I, I want to finish by saying something about uh, uh, where I'm going. Uh, so I've talked about the use of cognitive maps in order to, uh, to think more intentionally and critically about the social data that we've got. I've talked about um, uh, using a new kind of analytic vocabulary uh, talking about recruitment or disaffiliation or loyalty or things like that, rather than the heavily theological, uh, theologized vocabulary that, that, we've using, that we've been using. And uh, I also want to uh, conclude by talking about um, uh, theorizing various aspects of uh, early Christ groups uh, um, that that also intentionally moves away from the kind of theological frameworks to which we have been uh, wedded in the past. Um, the basic methodological starting point uh, for the work that I'm doing right now is the recognition that we know uh, far more about the nature, organization, and activities of small face-to-face -face associations in the ancient world than we do about Christ assemblies. Our ignorance is a function of the kinds of data that we have about Christ assemblies. Almost all of the primary evidence comes from literary sources, gospels, letters, uh, tractates from members of those Christ assemblies. These data, there are these, these, uh, ev th th these data provide very scant descriptions of the groups for which they were penned, probably because the information, uh, such information was hardly relevant uh, to the subject matter of those writings. The letters of Paul, and other uh, early Christ followers routinely employed terms like ecclesia or synagogue, uh, but are silent about the details of the organization of these groups. As occasional compositions, Paul letters, Paul's letters 
address only a small set of issues with which he was concerned, and ignore matters of common knowledge between him and his addressees. Hence, he's unconcerned to address most of the issues uh, that interest me, at least, about group size. How large was the Christ group? Uh, what was the method of selecting leaders? What, was the what were the financing, of, uh, fi how, how are groups financed? Uh, and Paul's letters ignore these, probably because they were unproblematic for him. He only addresses issues that, where there was a problem and things that were completely routine. There's no point in him talking about. But if we're to under understand the dynamics of these groups, we have to think, we have to devise some ways to think about those kinds of practical issues. This also means that scholars uh, have been up to now left to infer or to speculate uh, how Christ groups came into being, their size, their models of governance, their finances, the location of meetings, and the types of persons uh, that belong to them. When thinking about the associative practices of Christ assemblies, how and why people belonged, it's useful heuristically to begin with what is known. And what is known, uh, I think, uh, is the practices of small face-to-face -face associations. And we've got lots and lots of data on this. Associations materialized membership in various ways by creating ALBA, by, by, by creating membership lists um, that made belonging visible and occasionally erasing the names of those who had once belonged and who had violated the behavioral norms of the group. They materialized belonging by devising entrance rituals that marked entry into the group by conducting periodic meals, by engaging in processions uh, that put the group on public display, by insisting on members participating in the funerals of their colleagues, uh, by elaborating a set of common ethical rules that marked uh, membership, usually including sanctions on misbehavior. The critical importance of belonging to a larger collectivity is underscored by the well-known observations of Clifford Geertz to the effect that in most of the world's cultures, including the Mediterranean, identity was formed dyadically. Individuals were always understood as belonging to a larger identity group, and it was through those identity groups that one was known. In the ancient Mediterranean, the principal identity groups were family, clan, clan village, deem, uh, cultic association, legion, occupational guild, and so forth. Belonging thus conferred identity and located the individual within the complex space of the city. As American Express's slogan suggests, membership has its privileges. Membership in most associations, including Christ groups, I take it, had an informal and sometimes a formal contractual aspect to it. The behavioral rules to which one submitted also meant that one could rely on those rules to be enforced. Um, this is approached, an approach to thinking about Christian origins that's rarely uh, undertaken, because we think of uh, groups as that you belong to a group because of the salvation or whatever that it, that it, uh, that it offers, and rules are kind of uh, subsidiary to that. But in fact, I argue rules are actually what create the group. Um, some rules required membership members to afford assistance to fellow members in, in distress. Others required members to celebrate the uh, achievements of their fellows, to join in the honors and recognitions of members, and in other ways to make belonging visible and real. Rules had the effect of creating a, a trust network, that's the coinage of Charles Tilley, uh, and now invoked to think about the function of associative behavior in antiquity. The articulation and enforcing of behavioral rules meant that members could rely on a certain standard of conduct by fellow members. It would always be safer to depend on a fellow member, even on matters not covered by the rules, uh, than it would be to de depend on uh, non-members. And I think this is intuitive. If you have a plumber who belongs to your church, it's probably safer to use him as the, uh, or her as your plumber or your lawyer or your accountant than to go outside. And in fact, that's exactly how this, this associative behavior and antiquity worked. It's always safer to deal with a community member or an, a, an association member than it is uh, to deal uh, with anybody else. Uh, evolutionary anthropologist Richard Sossis has underscored the critical value of behavioral rules in cementing belonging and the solidarity and the cooperative behavior that comes along with it. He analyzed 200 U.S. communes, mostly from the 19th century, uh, 
parsing them into socialist, anarchist, uh, and other secular groups on the one hand, and shakers and religious groups on the other hand. In general, religious communes survived four times as long as secular communes, and shakers lasted 18 times as long as utopian socialist groups, in spite of the fact that they did not allow marriage and hence could not avail themselves of intergenerational recruitment. In addition, Sassus was able to show that communes that had strict behavioral rules, what he calls costly requirements, uh, such as the prohibition of the consumption of alcohol or coffee or tobacco or meat, or the control of jewelry, clothing, hairstyles, and communication with outsiders, also had greater longevity than secular communes and were much less likely to dissolve as a result of internal conflict. <coughs> These findings presumably reflect a high level of inter intergroup uh, commitment and suggest that costly requirements have the effect of enhancing solidarity. Sassus and Bressler don't claim that the presence of costly requirements is the only factor that accounts for longevity, but argue that it's at least a necessary condition for long-term survival. Seen in this context, the associative practices of ancient cultic groups and occupational guilds and Christ groups uh, Within the framework of the behavior of uh, 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 within the framework of behavioral economics uh, for Tilly, or, or behavioral ecology for Sassis, it's easy to see the practice of Christ assemblies uh, also serving uh, the the um, uh, the rule behavior the rule based behavior as what cultivates and nurtures uh, a sense uh, of um, uh, of belonging. Let's skip over another page. Uh, good. Um, Comparison of the behavior of Christ assemblies with that of other comparable groups, that allows us to take note of similarities and differences and to theorize the practices of Christ groups. By setting certain aspects of Christ assemblies beside the associated behaviors of occupational guilds and cultic associations, we can understand something of the durability of their practices and to hypothesize the attraction that they may have held for outsiders. Um, not that this is meant to account for their ultimate success. It uh, also has the effect of what I think of as normalizing the discourse um, about Christ, uh, Christ assemblies. They are treated as interesting examples of typical social interactions with some notable aspects um, and many features that were typical of other groups as well. Comparison and the use of social theories resists the impulse to exoticize Christ assemblies or to, to treat them as sui generis. But at the same time, there's no claim uh, that they were alike their comparanda in all respects. Instead, it allows us both to see typicalities and uh, to see differences. There are many other opportunities for the constructing of a social history of, uh, or of the Christ cult that engage in other domains of knowledge and produce uh, a richer and less insular account of Christian origins. Uh, some colleagues are looking to cognitive science and at evolutionary anthropology, Risto or, uh, Uro and his Helsinki group. Ritual theory, I think, uh, shows a lot of promise and there are some useful uh, applications of social network theory to the ancient world, including the diffusion of the uh, early Christ cult. We're now faced with multiple theoretical frameworks from the social sciences, mainly from anthropology, I think, to assist us in thinking about Christian origins, and each of these uh, has the, holds out the promise uh, of the creation of new knowledge. Thanks. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. John? Just launch in. Lovely, thank you so much. This is so useful and, and really interesting. Um, I know it starts with 1968, but I wondered if you might reflect a little bit on Max Weber <laughs> with, um, with uh, Robin Scroggs' article and, and, and how the concept of the sect is, you know, sort of really gets a resurgence at that time. Um, you mean why? <coughs> or, um... Yeah, just sort of uh, thinking more about how uh, really the, the, those, those categories were already created, and then it was a case of then really kind of remembering that there was this discussion. So sometimes, as you say, um, the people write books and they're not sort of picked up for a long time. But then sometimes a lot is said at one time, and then everyone kind of goes, yeah, yeah, 
and then forgets about it, and then it needs to be re-remembered um, in scholarship. Um, I also just wanted to ask you about um, where you place Marxist analysis and feminist analysis in terms of social science. Well, uh, in the, Marx, the feminist analysis, at least as I see it, is also what happens at the end of the Vietnam War. I mean, the Vietnam War, at least in the US and Canada, had been something that pulled together, the opposition to it, had pulled together all sorts of intellectuals into a kind of uh, single group. And after that ended, what, you, what happened is that these groups all fragmented. And that's where you start to get femi you know, feminist analysis becoming its own thing and uh, other kinds of things becoming their own thing. It, it, you know, the Vietnam War had this, or the opposition to the war had the effect of kind of pulling together uh, all sorts of intellectuals against one issue. And then when the, when the war ended, then, then people started going their own way. So I mean, that's, that's when Elizabeth Fiorenza starts writing and so forth. And, and some of her colleagues, yeah. Social scientific. Yeah, and, but the earlier point about Scroggs is, I mean, uh, in the preface to the republication of uh, Scroggs' uh, essay, he talks about what it was that led him to do this. And you know, he says there that he started reading Marcuse. Uh, and he's also reading Brian Wilson, who had written much before 1975, and uh, Werner Stark, and so forth. So there, were these, there was these talk, sociologists were already talking about, about the sociology of sectarianism. But I think what happens is, uh, these sort of political and cultural occurrences in the late 60s are the thing that pushes New Testament scholars to start to rethink what it is that they're really about, and then they reach out to others' resources, uh, the sociology of sectarianism. And Marxist, Marxist analysis becomes important at that, at that point, too. So it, you know, it's these kind of, I think, political and social events that push scholarship to do different things. Uh, and to use resources that were already there. Um, there's also a really inter uh, a colleague in anthropology made an interesting point about Marxism. You know, up to 1992, Marxist analysis was just de rigueur in all sociology and all anthropology departments. Everybody did it. Um, at, with the fall of the Soviet Union, all of a sudden, uh, Marxist these kind of globalized Marxist theories seemed like they, you know, a lot of the wind went out of the sails. And so people started talking about micro-resistance, right? So all of a sudden, micro-resistance becomes the big thing, not the, these kind of, so it's really interesting how uh, something like, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall has a knock-on effect on the way in which we think, uh, you know, our analytic categories uh, change. Um, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in these kinds of correlations between uh, political and social events on one hand and how it is that we think of our job as scholars. And because there's really interesting connections. The whole second half of the book, Excavating Q, was, was trying to think about how scholarship on Q fit into these much broader uh, categories. And you see how discourse changes from one generation to another. So, you know, whether we like it or not, we're embedded in American politics, British politics, you know, and, and other kinds of things. And these have an effect on the way in which we, we think we're doing our job. I think Babel was translated into English in the 60s as well. I think it's something that's, uh, that's also Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's so interesting it when, these, when yeah. these things, you know, yeah. all of a sudden become available. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. I really enjoyed that. Night. Lots of things, you know, we might, we might talk about. I'll try and resist. I mean, sort of anecdotally, I think, you know, in support of your kind of 1968 and those sort of context focuses, I mean, uh, there's this amazing footnote, the final footnote in Tyson's Sociology de Years of the Being, where he's very defensive, long footnote, where you can use conflict theory and not necessarily be a Marxist, and we kind of need yeah. that, that, that context. And I think it was John Elliott who used to talk about there was some group called the Bastards or something. Yeah, the Bastards, Bastards yeah. Bay was, Area, yeah, something or other. Yeah, you know, protest against the Vietnam. I, I wonder, perhaps, you know, having talked to you last night about your interest in network theory and epidemiology and so on, I just wondered whether you might reflect on, or whether you thought about how far that kind of theory could be applied not only to kind of theorizing Christian origins, but theorizing modern scholarship's take on things. I mean, I was thinking about what you said about, so the 1975 Sprogs uses this label sectarian, which is kind of almost shocking and radical. Yeah. And then there's a particular group who are interested in kind of quite a small group, 
interested in this kind of idea. And you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years later, almost any commentary on John's Gospel will talk about it being sectarian. As, and similarly made with the context groups, like you, know, you start a very small group, very sort of defined methodological kind of focus, becomes diverse, spreads out, you know, a number of people talk about honor and shame, or whatever it becomes. So I don't know whether, I mean, I know you've used the network theory stuff, thinking about Christian origins, would you? Or have you thought about applying it to the, the understanding of modern scholarship? I mean, it, ma it makes sense to me to do that. And um, you know, it's, I am interested in these kinds of scholarly legacies. I, I hadn't thought of it quite in those terms, but I've worked, I, I've worked in another uh, realm of my, my, my life on um, uh, Catholic synoptic problem, uh, the Catholic synoptic problem issues from 1911 to 1953. And you can think of it in terms of network theory. That is, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of scholars: Friedrich Meyer, Josef Sickenberg, uh, Anton Fuchler, Rudolf Schnackenberg, and they turn out all to be students of one another. So, I mean, you can see how this thing goes, uh, and that's a kind of uh, you know, it's a kind of scholarly network, and uh, it keeps alive the two document hypothesis in spite of the suppression, the official suppression of the two document hypothesis. And you can do exactly the same thing, I think. Uh, in tracing other kinds of scholarly networks and legacies. Um, uh, uh, just your earlier point about Tyson, I, you know, I, I, I'm a good friend of Paul Hofmann, and Tyson and Hofmann are, are the two guys who, in 1968-69, start to think about early Christianity as a countercultural movement. And I, <coughs> so I asked Paul, why did you write this article on, it's the, on the temptation of Jesus? It comes out, it comes out in Dubush's Zeitschrift, I think, in 1969. And he said, the riots, 1968. Uh, so, and that's, you know, as a Catholic, that's what drove him to think the fortunes of, of uh, the Catholic Church and Catholic theology are not tied to the German state. That we, we actually need to think about uh, protest and countercultural movements. And, he becomes then, you know, a member of one of these kind of Catholic groups that celebrates mass in in the house and things like that. And so it's and it, and uh, you know, 1968 was the thing that did it for him. And so you see that and I think you've said things along the same lines that that was a real turning point for uh, both Protestants and Catholics, not only in Europe but in in, in North America as well. So it's. Yeah. I think the supplements of this is some of the big political agendas of the 20th century that I think are crucial for understanding some of these shifts. I agree with everything you said on this, and I would probably add that something like the form criticism and the avoidance of social context emerges when fascism is really on the rise. Yeah. So if you want to look at social context, it means Jewish social context, therefore avoid it as best as possible. Uh, and so atheistic Soviet communism is that you know, don't want to be looking too materialistically. And the 68 thing I think is very important. But in addition to this, you get neoliberalism emerging from 68 and intense discussions on individualism, agency, and mm. so on in social scientific criticism. I mean, the debates that uh, you, you two both had with Zephyr Crook and Philip Esther really about, about agency and not, uh, what degree of agency. I mean, all these issues are, are there in the background and are crucial for this. One more, yes? I have a boring question, but you mentioned hours jaded about book reviews at this point. You know, when, uh, when Bauer's book was reviewed, um, I mean, the major reviews would be, would be TLZ, 
uh, which everybody paid attention to, and one or two other things. So the number of m main reviewing instruments were relatively small, and hence very, very influential. Uh, now, reviews are a kind of a dime a dozen. Uh, and you, you get flooded with book reviews, and you also get flooded with, with, frankly, with book reviews written by people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so whether it's positive or negative or neutral, you know, there's so much noise in the book review se uh, section that it's hard to, it's, you know, if, and some, you know, and often senior scholars don't review books anymore. You know, we got, we're, you know, we've got too many other things that we're doing. And so, I mean, my, my hunch is that reviews don't have anywhere as near the influence that they used to have just because. Uh, this is good. Over the course of the last decade, particularly among younger English scholars, I don't know if this is also revealing my network, but I don't know if anyone that really takes RBO reviews seriously anymore. I mean, everyone just is indeed, whether it's good or bad, yeah. no one really cares anymore. And I know if we're doing a blog, we would get presses beating down our door to try to get us, they would much rather us mention this just once and put it on social media than it get reviewed in the book, or in the book review. Yeah, yeah. You know, I take more seriously Bryn Mawr classical review. The, they, they tend to be very, very good and detailed reviews, often by people who really do know what they're talking about, or at least I assume they do. Um, RBL is kind of hit and miss. Sometimes it's, you know, it's just noise. Um, and then, you know, New Testament studies doesn't review any books at all. Uh, Novum Testamentum hardly ever does, and it's all J.K. Eliot that reviews everything there. Um, uh, which <laughs> has its own particularities. Uh, so I don't know. Um, uh, I, I think a, a better index is uh, uh, the way in which uh, publications then get recited and so forth. And you see, you know, somebody publishes something and then it starts to appear in everybody's footnotes. Uh, uh, okay, thank you, John, for a wonderful paper. Sure I appreciate it.